Hey y'all, welcome back. Time to get going on some really exciting stuff with our Bowie Range A50. We gonna have a two part episode again because I have a feeling the deep dive into the schematic is gonna take a little while. But I wanted to talk about the listening perceptions after turning up the B plus and definitely a positive. It was a lot richer sounding and just as I expected the bass seems fuller and the amp just seems a lot more authoritative. So if this was as far as you really felt uh, comfortable modifying this amp I still think you're going to be really happy with the end product of this. The other thing that was a little surprising to me was I retried swapping in the Treasure 300B-Z mesh plate, the black coated um, kind of upgrade tubes, and this time I heard a difference. With the B plus lower, I couldn't hear a difference. And they do sound, you know, like a, a step richer than these PS Vane plain 300B tubes sound. But the PS Vane ones don't sound bad. And Given the price point of this amp, because this is like a thousand dollar amplifier, and then you spend another two hundred and twenty dollars even on sale for those tubes, yes, they sound better. And if you're really trying to, you know, like take this lamp amp as far as it can go, those tubes are a nice investment. But if you're on a budget and we're trying to like really just replace as little as possible, you can probably get by with the tubes this comes with. Because we're already throwing away the rectifier tube, we're throwing away the two SN7s, and you know, if we you spend the $220, that's a quarter of the price of the amp. But if you want to do it, not going to say no, it actually does make a difference, unlike a lot of audio things. And if you were planning on buying some cable elevators or some other crazy audio nonsense buying those tubes is a valid investment. I am going to say though that there is a point of diminishing returns and for example I'm just not sure that like replacing the output transformers on this are really going to give you a lot of bang for your buck. These seem to be pretty decent. And looking at the distortion figures that are coming out of these, I I think these are probably better than the Ed cores that I have in my other amp. And I'm just not sure what spending another $500 on some Electroprint or some ISO Tangos or something like that are going to get you over these. I mean, I took one of these off and looked. They are potted. And so, you know, it, it's a decent, they look like decent output transformers. The, the other thing that I did some research on, these 25 volt cathode resistors that I was talking about possibly replacing. These are 25 watts. They've only got, they got less than 5 watts of, of power going through them. So I think they'll be fine. But they do need to be moved further away from the capacitors. And we'll get into that in another episode, maybe even in this cycle of stuff. The good thing is the 300B tubes are the circuit board that they're in is well designed. And we don't need to rewire how the 300B is wired up. Because if we did, that would mean replacing the circuit boards, which somebody would have to make them and that would be a nightmare. The good thing is, is I believe all of the problem exists in the front end, the way the 6S and 7s are wired, and they're wired point to point, which will be real easy to go in and remove resistors and move wires around and re rewire the front end. So this amp is a really good candidate to buy, modify, and turn into something much nicer than what you got in the box when you purchased it. Again, if we start throwing away transformers and all the tubes and, you know, 
totally rebuilding everything, replacing power transformers and all that stuff, I would question why we're buying, why we're spending a thousand dollars on an amplifier that we're throwing everything away except the chassis. So we're going to try to not do that and we're going to try to get as much out of this thing with the lowest parts cost and I'm going to be doing a lot of the tuning and stuff with the factory PS Vane 300B tubes so that you don't have to invest too much money in this. Like I said, this is going to be a two-part video. We're probably not going to get into any construction today. We're going to mostly focus on doing a deep dive into the schematic and see if I can explain what it is we're going to be doing and how the basic circuit design of a tube amp works so that you can understand what you're doing. So let's jump into the schematic. So here we have the two designs sitting on top of each other, drawn in a very similar format so it's easier to follow. This is the Bowie Range A50, and here's the Skunky Designs version of it. First, we'll follow the input signal through the amplifier. I do need to measure this. I just left this 100K because that's usually what volume controls are, but we'll measure it and see. But it doesn't really matter whether it's 50 or 100K. What this is doing is it's splitting the input signal between ground and the grid of the tube. So as you turn the volume down, it grounds some of the signal, and as you turn it up, it sends more of it to the grid of this first stage tube grid. This resistor right here, it's a grid leak resistor, and you can actually do without this resistor in an amplifier, if it has a volume control, and allow it to ground the grid or reference the grid to ground through the volume control. But it's really not a good idea because if some dust gets in the volume control and this goes open, and the grid loses its reference to, reference to ground, then it starts conducting and the tube just goes wide open, red plates, and that usually stuff bad stuff happens. So this is more of a little safety device just in case the volume control does fail. So the grid controls the flow of current through this first stage of tube not the voltage, the current. This resistor here is the cathode bias resistor and it sets the negative bias on the grid of this tube. And as you can see it has 1.2 volts here. Well that creates a negative 1.2 volts when you're referencing the cathode to the grid of the tube. And the tubes want to see negative voltage on the grid. You don't want it to go positive. So that's the purpose of this resistor here. What happens when the signal goes, the sine wave or the up and down uh, signal goes through the grid, it causes the current across this tube to vary. Now what creates the voltage amplification is the difference between the voltage across this plate load resistor as the current goes up and down. The more current that passes through there, this voltage drops, and the less current makes this voltage go up in direct relation to the signal on the grid. By the way that this operates, it inverts the signal. So what's positive here is negative here, and what's negative here is positive here. It flips the sine wave upside down, which is no big deal. So at that point, this voltage that's been amplified from what's here goes into the grid of this tube. And same thing happens is this goes up and down. It varies the current across here. It varies the voltage drop across this plate load resistor. 
which amplifies the signal. This is what's referred to as a two-stage driver. First it goes through the grid of this tube, then it goes through this one, and it's called what a direct coupled in that there's no uh, coupling capacitor here. The plate of this is connected directly to the grid of this. And some people think that that makes the amp sound better because you don't have another capacitor that can introduce some distortion or other issues. So then you have the amplified voltage here that then goes through this coupling capacitor to the grid of the 300B. And you have this grid leak resistor here that performs pretty much the same function that it's referencing the grid to ground. And this is like 67 volts. So from the cathode to the grid, there's negative 67 volts of bias. And it also, if the electrons coming off this cathode, some of them leak into the grid and they run through this path to ground. And so the value of this has to be low enough to keep the bias negative like it needs to be. And if you get this too high, like if you put a one meg resistor here, then the voltage here would climb to the point where this tube would take off, red plate, melt the transformers, all sorts of bad things would happen. So that's why I'm a little concerned about this resistor being so high a voltage. The other thing that we have going on in the driver stage is you have a RC or resistor capacitor network here that acts as a filter. What you don't want happening, because as we saw here, there's an AC signal here that's going to the grid of this tube off the plate of this tube. What we don't want is for that AC signal to go into the output transformer and over to the plate of this tube. Then you get a feedback loop going and the amp will do what they call motor boating. It just starts going and it, it sounds horrible. And so this resistor combined with this capacitor creates a uh, filtering network that blocks the AC and or grounds it through this capacitor so it doesn't go back and create a feedback loop with the output tube. The problem I feel with this setup is it's just not capable of creating enough voltage swing on the grid of the 300B, especially considering the capacitance that this tube has inside it. The grid to the cathode and the grid to the plate have capacitor or capacitance ratings, and a 300B one's fairly high, which means that it's trying to suck that signal to ground, and you gotta have a pretty strong or pretty high milliamps of current available in this voltage swing for the full signal to be seen at the grid of this tube. And I think that while this tube's perfectly capable of driving this tube, this single tube isn't enough to get the 140 to 150 volts peak to peak at the amps that need to be sent to the grid of this tube to drive it and that's why we're not seeing the output from this tube that we should. So, in this tube, and again, this is a two-stage, so it inverts the signal, it inverts the signal, it inverts the signal. In this setup, it's they call this a cast code. And the ODE name of this setup is taken from it makes these two triodes behave like a pentode. And there's a lot of high-end or you know very classic 300B amps that use a pentode to drive the 300B. The problem with a lot of pentodes is they aren't super linear. And that's one of the 
just great things about a 6S and 7 and why they get used in so many amplifiers is they are super linear and they just sound really good. So by turning these two triodes into what amounts to a virtual pentode, you get the best of both worlds. You get the linearity and the great sound of a 6S and 7, but you get the power and drive that a pentode would have. So, signal comes in here. We're going to change this to a 1 mag. It doesn't need to be this low a value. 1 mag is plenty to reference ground of, of this tube. The other thing we're going to do here is we're going to drop this to a 470 ohm and then we're going to bypass this with a 100 UF 16 volt cap. What bypassing this resistor does is it gives this tube more drive. An unbypassed resistor like this acts as like almost a negative feedback loop that it's it's letting some of the AC feedback into the cathode and does reduce distortion but it also reduces the power output of that stage of the tube. So we're going to bypass this. Then here's the huge difference. On this one, the plate is connected to the grid and is powered up. In this example, the plate is hooked directly to the cathode of this tube with just a single connection with nothing else connected to it. Doing that, it makes the grid of what I call the upper section of the cascode behave like the screen of a pentode. And being that that's what this has become is a virtual pentode, we're going to create a voltage divider from, we're going to pick the voltage up before the plate load resistor so that there's no voltage swing on this voltage divider. And we're going to go across from here to ground with these two values of resistors, and they can be little half watt guys, to get around 90 volts on the screen, well, the actually the grid of the upper section. And it's just a fixed voltage. We also are going to run a small between a 0 0.22, 0 0.33, this value isn't super critical, cap across this resistor for the same reason this is done to eliminate um, negative feedback going into the screen and to boost the output of this cascode. Then in the final part, the plate of the upper section of the cascode comes across here it's fed by this RC network again to eliminate motor boning. And the voltage swing across this grid is then regulating the current that's going through both sections of this tube. And here's where the voltage amplification happens is across this 47K resistor, or yeah, 47K resistor, and then is fed through this coupling capacitor to the grid of the 300B. And then we're gonna drop this down to a 370K to get more in line with what the grid leak resistor for a 300B should be. I wanna explain real quick how these coupling capacitors work and why they're there. So we know we have negative 67 volts on the grid of this 300B2 on both examples. And your referencing from cathode to grid is where you get the 67 volts. We got 165 volts positive DC voltage here. And these voltage numbers are all DC, okay? So we do not want to be feeding 165 volts positive DC into the grid of this tube. 
because it would just melt the inside of this tube when the grid was went that much positive. So what this coupling capacitor does is it blocks the DC, but the AC, because it's like going positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, it, it is able to cross this capacitor and that sine wave is seen on the grid of this tube where the DC isn't. So like at this point, let's say we have, you know, 140 volts of swing D, uh, AC. It's centered on 165 volts DC. So if you looked at it on a scope, the zero line would be sitting like if this was the normal zero line for, you know, looking at the sine wave, it would be way up here, but it would be the same swing on both sides of the line that's up here at 165 volts. Well, we need to bring it back down here to, it's going to be at negative 67 volts and be swinging on each side of that. So I hope that makes sense about, you know, this coupling cap and why it's here. So here's the other thing that I want to go over is why this works so much better than this. The first thing we're changing is this has got a 10K resistor between the B plus and this point in the RC network that's feeding the 6S and 7 plate. Okay, in this example, it's 320 volts. In this example down here, we're going to use a 4.7K, so we're going to use half the resistance, and we're going to have 400 volts here before the plate load resistors. On the other side of this plate load resistor, we have 165 volts. Well, in this example, with this lower resistor, lower resistance plate load resistor, it's at 250 volts. So the difference between this voltage at this point and the voltage on the other side of the plate load resistor, and remember I explained, the current of the tube makes the voltage go up and down across this resistor, we've only got 70 volts of voltage drop across this plate load resistor. In this case, we're going from 400 to 160, which is a huge increase in the drop across this plate load resistor, which gives us a lot more potential for swing. The other thing to note here that these two do share in common is that the grid of this tube, which is 92 volts in this example, 62 in this one, is lower than the cathode, which is 94 and 65. So we end up with a couple of volts, in both examples, we end up with a couple of volts negative on the grid of this tube, which is the screen in this case, which is what you want to see. You want to make sure that this voltage is slightly lower than this voltage. The other advantage to this setup is we really only have one uh, cathode resistor capacitor, where this case we have two of them. And this always introduces distortion that these capacitors are never ideal. The quality of this capacitor is super important. I mean, this needs to be, at the very least, something like a Nikicon Muse or um, this one I'm talking about. And this one should be a good one too. I mean, this should be at least uh, like a Solene film cap or maybe one of these Mundorf, you know, budget M caps. I don't think this has to be like a super high quality cap like this coupling cap does. So this is what we're going to be doing is changing the front end of the amp from this to this. And it's really going to have less wires, less parts, and it's going to be less complex going with this
than the current setup is, which is already pretty simple. So I hope that helps you understand what we're doing and why this works so much better. And the next step is just going to be to get busy rewiring it. The plan is to just do one channel to start with, and then I can show you on the scope and on the audio analyzer suite the difference that changing from a direct coupled two-stage front end to this CAS code single stage front end makes in the performance of the amplifier. And then one last thing, in I didn't really realize this until I wired it up my personal 300B amp up this way, that this really is a single stage. Even though there's two triodes that are involved, there's only one inversion of the input signal. So that's another kind of nice thing about this is the input signal mirrors the output signal because there's an even number of inversions. It gets inverted once here, and then it gets inverted back here, goes to the transformer to the speakers, where in this setup it's inverted, then it's inverted, and then it's inverted, so the output's the inversion of the input. And I don't think that really changes how it sounds, but I just feel like having an even number of inversions probably does sound better. And probably going to call this video here. This one's gotten longer than I expected. And so if you're enjoying my videos, please subscribe to my channel, like the video, and we'll see you in part two of this series in just a bit.